This is Anchored in Christ, the sermon podcast that gives you hope in the gospel as an anchor for your soul. Brought to you from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. We are in the sermon series, Thy Kingdom Come. We pray it when we pray the Lord's Prayer. It is what Jesus proclaimed. It's the striking availability of God here and now. So how do we live as kingdom people in a politicized, political world? This is our text. It comes from Luke 20, beginning with verse 20. It's found on page 73 in the New Testament of your Pew Bible. Luke 20, beginning with verse 20. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be honest in order to trap him by what he said, so as to hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. So they asked him, Teacher, We know that you are right in what you say and teach. You show deference to no one, but teach the way of God in accordance with truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But he perceived their craftiness and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose head? And whose title does it bear? They said, the emperor's. He said to them, then give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were not able, in the presence of the people, to trap him by what he said, to trap him by what he said. And being amazed by his answer, they became silent. Let us pray. Lord, this is inspired scripture. You were the one who said this in the presence of all. And so by your Holy Spirit, please illumine our hearts so that we can hear how to live as Christian citizens in a political world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. During children's church one Sunday, a youth director was teaching a song to the children, and it included a line, He has conquered every foe. Well, watching the puzzled expression on the children's faces, the director said, and were still unsure about who in the world their enemies were. So the youth director said, well, the name of our foe begins with the letter D. He was referring to the devil, of course. But one child chimed in and said, oh, you mean the Democrats. (laughs) Jesus in our text, is in political hot water. We're going to look at that. We're also going to look at the Christian's response to politics. And finally, we will look at living as Christian citizens. I am greatly indebted to Tim Keller of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, who preached on a parallel text 19 years text 19 years ago and from that sermon we are gleaning insights today Jesus in political hot water we find Jesus here in Jerusalem in his last week of his earthly ministry days before he rode into Jerusalem with great fanfare People shouting Hosanna, laying palm branches in the road. It was a welcome fit for a king. Jesus went straight into the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He took a whip and got the livestock out 
of the temple court. He cleansed it of every defiling element. Now, the religious leaders are riled up. They are on their guard and on the attack to trap Jesus in what he says. Verse 20. They do it by pretending to be honest. It would be like saying that uh, you are totally sincere even when you don't mean it. So they butter up Jesus and they give him affirmations. Oh, we know that you're from God. We know that you don't have any kind of sway about what people's opinion, that you're just going to tell us the truth. Bang. They've pushed him into a corner. They are now asking him in front of the multitudes, in front of the Romans, in front of the religious leaders, is it lawful to pay tax to the emperor or not? Now, the tax that they're referring to is the head tax. It's annual. The Jews hated this tax before the Americans hated this tax. Before the American Revolution, you know that the colonists were so angry with England for having taxation without representation. In Israel, every adult had to pay an annual head tax for the privilege of being Caesar's subject. It was one denarius. That is not a lot of money. It was the daily pay for the lowest wage earner. So it was still hated because it was showing the Jews that they were a subjected people. They were ruled by a foreign pagan government and they opposed it. 25 years earlier, a man named Judas the Galilean led the Jews in a rebellion against the Romans. He did it in three ways. First, he urged all the Jews not to pay the head tax. Two, he went in and he cleansed the temple of all defiling pagan elements. And three, he proclaimed the coming of God's kingdom by actively not participating in oppression or injustice in the land. Now, how do you think the authorities responded? They crushed him. He was put to death. 25 years later, Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God. It's the cornerstone of his ministry. And he has gone in and he's cleansed the temple. Do you see what's happening here? This is a trap. They want to know, okay, just say the word. Are we to the word? Are we to pay the head tax? Or not. He is now in hot water. If he says, yes, pay the head tax, everybody's going to think he's full of hot air. For three years, he's been proclaiming the kingdom of God as a reality. The Old Testament, when it speaks of God's kingdom, it speaks of meeting real human need, of real suffering and pain and oppression being overturned. When Jesus preached his first sermon, which is recorded in Luke 4, he utilizes Isaiah 61. And he says, in himself, in his own person, he is bringing in the kingdom of God. And good will come. And real human need will be met. Yes, pay the tax. Everyone is going to go, you mean you are supporting Rome? You're supporting the government that oppresses us? We don't even believe in you anymore. You're no good. You're just full of hot air. If on the other hand, Jesus says, no, don't pay the tax. He's calling for an insurrection of the Jews against Rome. And what will happen? Everyone will be crushed immediately. He is in hot water, so what does he do? He asks for a coin. Show me a denarius. 
Charles Doyle, a member of our church, makes it a profession of his to make coin replicas. And he has provided us with coin replicas. And he has provided us with a denarius that is a replica of the very coin that Jesus held. And a denarius has on it an icon, an image of Tiberius Caesar with words on the back and a man seated on a throne. Jesus asks, whose head, whose title does it bear? They say the emperor's. What it is, it says, Caesar, which means king, son of the god Augustus, pontiff maxim, that means high priest. Suddenly we see what's going on here. Two kings are sharing one stage. Both say, both say, I'm king. Both present themselves as the Son of God. Both offer themselves as the high priest. But look, look at how these kings differ. And look at their kingdoms. They could not be further apart. One possesses all the wealth of the empire. And the other doesn't have a quarter in his pocket. He has to ask for a coin. Whose head? Whose title does this bear? The emperor's. Then give to the emperor what belongs to the emperor and to God the things that are God's. What our English Bibles do not reveal to us is that Jesus changes the verb. They say, shall we give the tax? And he says, you shall render the tax. Shall we give, just give a blank check, give everything? No. Pay back what is owed to that person. It's a different verb, render, in our English. Give back to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Give back to God what belongs to God. The coin has Tiberius Caesar's image on it. The money belongs to him. You and I are made in God's image. We belong to God. Give back to God what belongs to him, ourself, our lives. Were Jesus' opponents angry as if he had dodged? No. They were amazed, silenced. So what do we learn from Jesus' response? It's us to politics. Jesus' response guards us against political simplicity, political primacy, and political complacency. Let's look at this. Guarding against political simplicity. Jesus' opponents want him to say yes or no. It's a temptation. Come on into my trap. Come on, just say yes or no. Jesus resists. When he is talking about our relationship to God in the kingdom, he presents it in clear, simple language. When he's talking about our relationship to the state, he does not give simple yes or no. It would be like asking Jesus which party he's for, Republican or Democrat. He will not give us us a simple answer. He does not endorse a specific platform or a specific political party, and he does not teach us to give simple answers either. What if a Christian believes that the environment is the the number one issue? That person will vote for a candidate who champions the environment. What if, out of deep biblical conviction, a Christian votes on the basis of racial justice or life for the unborn or a host of other issues? Jesus does not tell Bible-believing Christians whom to vote for. 
He does not let us fall into the trap of political simplicity. We should not do what Jesus would not do. And if any of us, if any of us have judged a brother or sister for the way they vote, then this is a day for repentance and a day for us to seek forgiveness. We've mixed up God and Caesar, and Jesus will not allow us to do that. Secondly, Jesus' response guards us against political primacy. That is, the belief that politics is the solution to what ails us. It's the primary authority for us. So when Jesus substituted the verb, he took away give to Caesar, and he said render to Caesar. He was the first one in human history to limit the authority of leaders. Up until then, every king had divine authority. No one could question their leaders. That's why on the coin, it question God. Jesus teaches us to guard against placing any person as our prime authority, as if that person spoke with the voice of God. Render to Caesar. Literally, give back to Caesar what belongs to him, what he deserves. Pay him his money. But do not give him what he does not deserve. Does a tyrant deserve complete acceptance of wholesale systems of oppression and injustice? Caesar wants his subjects to give him total allegiance. Jesus teaches otherwise. This is what happened in the former Soviet Union. It was when Vice President George Bush represented the U.S. at the funeral of Leonid Brezhnev. The, cer the ceremony went with military precision, marching soldiers, steel helmets, Marxist rhetoric, but no prayers, no hymns, no mention of God. At the end of the ceremony, Mrs. Brezhnev walked up to her husband's coffin and stood motionless. As the soldiers came to close the lid, she performed an act that ranks up there with one of the most profound acts of civil disobedience ever committed. She traced the sign of the cross over her husband's chest. There in the citadel of atheistic power, secularism, the wife of the man who endorsed it all traced the sign of hope represented in Jesus who died on the cross a sign of petition that Jesus would have mercy on her husband in one simple act of civil disobedience God broke through the communist system. Jesus shows us we are not to have political primacy giving any government or person ultimate allegiance. Thirdly, Jesus' response guards us against political complacency. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's. He does not endorse us dropping out of the political system, being apolitical. I am sad to say, I know too many Christians who do not invest time in knowing what is going on politically. They live as though, though they are indifferent to the policies and events affecting millions. Karl Marx said that religion is the opiate of people. It may be. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is the smelling salt. It is what wakes us up. And once we are awake to the kingdom of God, we see, oh, there's so much that can be done. I must be involved. If we are in the kingdom, we have no option to be uninvolved. We may become more political. Let me illustrate with what I learned recently about the protests 
in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, 12% of the population are Christian. But the, the Christians play the most prominent role in peaceful protest against the Chinese Communist Party. China ranks 135th of all the nations in protecting human rights. The Christians of Hong Kong know this. Therefore, they've been on the front of this protest through marching, singing hymns, holding prayer circles, providing food and shelter for other demonstrators. According to Routers, the song, Sing Alleluia to the Lord, has become the national protest song. Because the Christians, when they saw the aggression of the police, began to sing that song. They have taught it to all the protests. Alleluia to the Lord. As a calming influence. In contrast, the international community has adopted an apolitical view towards China, overlooking its record of abuse in favor of military and economic gain. So how do we live as Christian citizens? Jesus teaches us to guard against political simplicity. Guard against political primacy. Guard against political complacency. And from Titus 3, verses 1 and 2, we see that we are to be subject. We are to be obedient to authority, whether that is a school principal or police or governor or the president. It says be ready for every good work. People in authority are meant to do good. And if they do not, we are not to follow them in doing evil but continue to do what is good and right. So, verse 2 of Titus 3. Remind them, speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle and courteous to everyone. This little tiny book of Titus, three chapters, is really caused by new Christians that came from the Jewish faith and we're now on the island of Crete. And they had attitude. And they said of the Cretans, this is chapter 1, verse 12, Cretans are always, this is chapter 1, verse 12, Cretans are always liars, vicious brutes, lazy gluttons. Now, island, I don't know if you know island behavior. You have to get along on an island. So we had Christians using words that slandered wholesale other people. And Paul will have none of it. Avoid quarreling and avoid such people. Instead, be gentle. That means mild, patient, moderate with your words. Show courtesy to everyone. And he says the word twice, all and all, everyone at all times. That means no one is excluded from being shown courtesy. And the word is used of Jesus as mild, meek. In other words, be slow to tweet. Apologize more. Be humble. Choose kindness. This is because the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God makes us humble. Because we find that the enemy is not on the other side of the aisle. The enemy is in our hearts. And when Jesus is Lord of our hearts, he places us in his kingdom, and therefore we live differently than the values of this world. How are we to live as Christian citizens? Let us be known for our love. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray that every one of us would be shown how we can move more toward living under your kingship 
in the kingdom that's present and to come, that you would be pleased with us as citizens. In your name we pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon from Old South Presbyterian Church in Newburyport, Massachusetts. If you'd like more information about our historic church, or you'd like to find out more about the gospel of Jesus, please visit our website at oldsouthnbpt.org. The peace of Christ be with you.